evidence, Father Mark signing on, continuing the history of the Catholicism in the United States, proceeding uh, with the next installment of the Second World War, brings us to 1942, January 30th. Uh, on that date, <coughs> a meeting was held, <coughs> which fits into the, the malign uh, history, the malignant history of the uh, what the Nazis called the final solution to the Jewish question, which is the Holocaust, the genocide. So this is the Vansay Conference. Vansay is a, uh, well, it, it's, it's a, the meeting took place in a villa, and Vansay is a, a neighborhood of Berlin, spelled W-A-N-N-S-E-E. -E. <clears throat> it was, uh, the meeting was presided over by an SS officer named Reinhard Heydrich. And uh, they estimated, the senior Nazis at the meeting, estimated that 11 million Jews lived in Europe. Their plan was to deport them all to camps set up in the conquered territories of Eastern Europe. Uh, captured Jews who were old or ill would be exterminated quickly. Those who were able to would be worked for the benefit of the Reich until death. This process was facilitated by the forced gathering of Jews in ghettos in conquered territory of Eastern Europe. The first concentration camp had uh, actually been created much earlier, before the Second World War, by the Nazis in Germany at Dachau in March of 1933. It was used for political opposition to murder political opponents, the communists, as well as murder those the Nazis classified as mentally ill or other social outcasts. The extermination camps uh, after the war, after the it was Vance conference, uh, the extermination camps organized homicides on an industrial scale using uh, poison gas, Zyklon B, which was a cyanide-based pesticide, and monumental ovens for evidence disposal. And uh, these extermination camps were, for the most part, in Poland, Czechoslovakia. So the famous names, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, uh, Belzic, and many, many others. The, uh, there, was a dis there, were, there were labor camps as distinct from extermination camps. I mean, at least in the, you know, the, uh, so the, the, the labor camps are made famous by the movie Schindler's List. You know, Liam Neeson played the guy, uh, Schindler. And uh, the labor, the ones that were designed for those, for those Jews who could still work, be worked to death instead of just immediately murdered, were uh, called the Arbeitslager, uh, the labor camps. On April 18th, 1942, the Americans borrowed a piece of unexpected aerial psychology from the British and bombed Tokyo. Sixteen B-25s under the command of Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle took off from a carrier, the USS Hornet, flew 800 miles to drop bombs on Japan. The physical damage well, there was damage. I mean, it did do damage, but it you know, was minimal in the larger scheme of things. But it did have an enormous psychological impact. Airborne refueling technology did not yet exist. So the planes had expended all their fuel. They passed over, and they uh, did a planned crash landing in China. As, uh, China was, was on our side, you know, at that point, fighting Japan. And uh, one plane made it all the way to Vladivostok. Uh, one of the crews... One of the crews, one of the 16 crews, was captured and beheaded, you know, executed. The rest survived. From June 4th to June 6th, 1942, the Battle of Midway Island was waged between fleets of the United States and Japan in the Pacific Ocean, and it proved to be a turning point in the Pacific theater of the war. The Japanese lost four aircraft carriers and 275 planes. The Americans lost one carrier. And from that point on, in retrospect, it was, it was clear that, the, that uh, Japan lost the initiative and would, would remain on the defensive for the rest of the war. July 13, 1942. 
the Nazis launched an attack on the Soviet city of Stalingrad on the Volga River in the southern part of the Soviet Union at the time. If it was captured, it would give the Germans unfettered access to the natural resources to the south, to the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Caucasus Mountains. It was fortunate for the world in history that Hitler ordered a simultaneous attack on Rostov on the Don River because this divided the Nazi forces, allowing their mutual support lines to be severed by the Russians and then attacked and defeated separately. By November 23, 1942, the Germans had suffered their first major defeat in the war. In retrospect, like Midway in the Pacific, after Stalingrad in Europe, the Germans would, for the most part, remain defensive, tactically defensive. Uh, so Stalingrad was a turning point in, in the European theater, as Midway was in the Pacific theater, and both occurred in 1942. Uh, Midway in June of 1942, and Stalingrad the following month in July. Well, the, the battle of Stalingrad started in July. It went, it went on a lot longer. It went on till till November, but uh, by November, the Germans had uh, definitively lost the Battle of Stalingrad. August 7, 1942, the American counterattack against Japanese-held islands in the Pacific began with a marine amphibious landing on the island of Guadalcanal. The Americans, the Marines, secured airfields for war use by, October, by August 20th, but it took until February 7th of the following year, 1943, to actually defeat all the Japanese resistance on the island. The Battle of Guadalcanal proved an indication of the tactical difficulties of attacking fortified positions on mountainous volcanic islands, and that was the topography of the islands in the Pacific. October 1, 1942, in a Vatican radio address, Pope Pius XII uh, condemned again, condemned the Nazis again, uh, uh, persecution of the Jewish race is how he phrased it, uh, and that's reported in the London Times. Uh, so another example, I mean, the whole silence of Pius XII, he, just, he was not silent. No. November 8, 1942, the American army became involved in fighting uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Western theater, the European, well, it wasn't actually Europe yet, but it was on the way, uh, by means of a landing in North Africa, on the uh, Mediterranean northern coast of Africa, to secure Morocco. The Axis powers... Uh, where it, this began a, a joint, uh, well, the British were already there fighting, the, the, and the Americans landed. Uh, so this uh, proved to be uh, a defeat. The, the Americans and the British defeated the Nazis and the Italians in North Africa, and the Axis forces in North Africa surrendered by May, surrendered on May 13, 1943. So between November 8th of 42 and May of 43. So that's, what, seven, seven months. While that fighting was going on, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, Pope Pius XII uh, gave another radio address in which he condemned, again, uh, violence against all groups based on race, all racially motivated violence. So again, the silence of Pius XII was not the case. It was not silent. From January 14th through January 23rd, 1943, Allied leaders met at Casablanca, Yes, in addition to being a classic movie, awesome movie worth seeing, Casablanca is a real place in Morocco. And there they uh, formulated, uh, figured, okay, now it was obvious by that point, by, by the beginning of 43, that things had turned in, in both the European, uh, you know, as well, that the, you know, the Germans lost Stalingrad, the Japanese at this point had lost two battles, uh, Midway and Guadalcanal, so it's obvious that things were turning. And so they have to think about, okay, what, what are we going to do? So it's at the Casablanca Conference, January 1943, that the Allies formulated their demand uh, or agreed that they would demand unconditional surrender as the only acceptable terms for conclusion of hostilities. Pope Pius denounced this as, re as repeating the mistakes of the First World War, that if you let them know that you're going to demand their absolute unconditional abject surrender, that is only going to guarantee that they will fight to the death in order to prolong the conflict 
Whereas Pius, you know, said if, if you offer him the possibility of some terms of surrender, it might end the war sooner and therefore less people would die. But anyway, that's what he did. The following month, February 2nd, 1943, uh, the last remaining Germans at Stalingrad surrendered. Uh, the, Hitler lost 300,000 killed and 93,000 captured. And for the first time in German history, not just Nazi history, but I mean through the whole history of Germany, a field marshal, a German field marshal surrendered. And at that point, the Soviet, the Red Army, uh, began their counterattack to push the Germans, because the Germans were still in Russia, so they, they, you know, this was definitely a turning point, but you know, they wanted to get the, the rest of the Germans out of Russia. So from that point, the Red Army was aimed toward Berlin. On June 2, 1943, Pope Pius XII gave an address to the College of Cardinals on the dilemma of addressing Nazi treatment of Jews. Previous protests had not obtained amelioration in the treatment of Jews. And public condemnation, one famous example in, uh, when the Dutch bishops did it, it provoked active reprisals against the Jews themselves. So not only was it not helping, but it was actively hurting. In 1963, a guy named Rolf Hochuth, H-O-C-H-H-U-T-H, published a book titled The Deputy, in which he began, this is the first appearance of the, you know, the, 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 the alleged silence of Pope Pius XII and accused him of being pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic. But as we've seen, it just, he was not silent. Uh, June 11, 1943. British joint, British and American uh, forces, invaded the island of Sicily uh, on the way to, so it's off the southwestern coast of Italy. Uh, and they captured it by August 17, 1943. While the Italians, remember they're, they're allied with, with the Nazis, uh, while the Italians were in the process of losing the battle for the island of Sicily, Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy who had allied with, with the Nazis, was overthrown, the Italians themselves overthrown, him on July 24th, 1943, in order to, to get out of the war. The Italians wanted to get out of the war. So they signed an armistice with the Allies on September 3rd, 1943. On the same day, British and American troops landed at Calabria. That's the toe of Italy, the mainland of Italy. And uh, their, their goal was to drive out the Nazi troops from the remainder of Italy, as well as any uh, remaining Italians who were you know, too compromised by membership in the fallen fascist government who, you know, so to, to surrender, so they were going to fight. On September 12, 1943, Nazi special forces rescued Mussolini from prison and enabled him to lead fascist loyalists to continue the war. Mussolini was later captured again, and this time he was executed near Lake Como on April 28, 1945. His uh, body was then, along with his mistress's body, was brought to Milan and was hung uh, upside down at a Milan gas station. From July 26 through July 29th, the British carried out a, a bombing of Hamburg, in Germany, or its a port at the confluence of the Elba and the Alstair rivers. Uh, it was chosen because it contained a dynamite factory. And uh, this was the proto firestorm. It wasn't intended to be that way, but uh, it turned out that when uh, temperature reaches 4,000 degrees, that the, uh, the Coriolis effect causes a, a cyclonic a vortex of updraft of superheated air results essentially in a, a tornado, a 1,500-foot high tornado of fire spinning at 150 miles an hour. Uh, 78,000 were killed in the Hamburg firestorm, and the city was destroyed, so another, you know, almost a million people were left homeless. October 16, 1943, Nazis in Italy, so they're on the defensive, and their friendly government is gone in Italy, but they were still there. And they were, they were fighting to, to hold Italy to prevent the Allies from being able to, you know, to take Italy, cross the Alps, and attack Germany from the south. So the Nazis ordered a, a roundup of the Jews in Rome. Pope Pius XII, again, you know, 
contrary to the, the canard about his silence and you know, his anti-Semitism. Pope Pius XII ordered his own Secretary of State, Cardinal Luigi Maglione, to protest to the German ambassador, Ernst von Weizsäcker. Uh, Weizsäcker did not deliver that protest to Berlin because he, he knew the Nazis better than Pius did, he knew that the Nazis would, would then launch, a, you know, would only would make it worse. Not, now, he didn't care about the church, but he did fear that, uh, you know, if, if he reported it and Hitler in one of his moods would order a retaliation against the Vatican, that that would provoke the local Italian population to rise up in urban warfare against the Nazis. But still, he, it was, he did, you know, Pius did, you know, protested to try to do what, you know, what he could. All right, on June 29th, 1943, Pope Pius issued a major encyclical, uh, 112 numbered sections, titled Mystici Corporis Christi, on the mystical body of Christ, in which he expounded on the nature of the church in terms of the mystical body of Christ. Uh, so the biblical foundations for this include, but are not limited to, Gospel of John, chapter 15, which records the parable of Jesus using the image of the vine and the branches. St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, in which he uses the image of one body and many parts to describe the church. St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, in which Paul described Christ as head over all things, for, and he described the church as his body, as the body of Christ. So this uh, encyclical on the mystical body is used uh, three times in the Catechism, specifically. Catechism number 797, refers to it in a teaching about the church as the temple of the Holy Spirit. What the soul is to the human body, the Holy Spirit is to the church. All are parts, all parts of the body are joined with each other and with the head of the church, which is Christ. Now that image of what the, the comparison of what the soul is to the body, the Holy Spirit is to the church, is based on a homily of St. Augustine, Sermon 267, which Pius referred to in Mystici Corporis. Catechism number 798 is a teaching on the Holy Spirit is, is the principle, the active principle of every saving action in each part of the body through which whatever means, whether it's through personal prayer, whether it's through personal charity or collective charity, in the case of you know, the church, through the, the sacraments, the, you know, the actual seven sacraments, through practice of the virtues, as well as through special charism, special gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given. And the Catechism number 1119, in a teaching on the sacraments, refers to Mystici Corporis, that the Church forms one mystical person with Christ as the head and acts in the sacraments as an organically structured priestly community. Members of the faithful who have received the sacrament of holy orders have as their, their telos, their end, their purpose, nourishing the church by preaching the word and offering the, the graces of the sacrament in the name of Christ. Anyway, and this Mystici Corporis would be referred to later in the Second Vatican Council numerous times. The uh, Nazis uh, formerly occupied Rome as they sensed the you know, the Italian population was, you know, they feared urban warfare against them, clandestine warfare. Uh, on September 10th, 1943, the, um, uh, okay. On September 30th, 1943, Pope Pius XII issued another encyclical, uh, Defino Afflante Spiritu, uh, on the modern methods of studying sacred scripture. Um, and that, well, I know seminary and Jeff whole courses on on that. So we, so I'll I'll leave that uh, later in this playlist when we uh, cover Vatican II. I might refer to it again. Is uh, Vatican II has a document, actually more than one document that deals with it. On June fourth, nineteen forty four, the city of Rome was liberated by the American army. Two days later, coincidentally. Uh, June 6, 1944, D-Day. 4,000 ships and transports 
landed 176,000 American, British, Canadian, and Australian and New Zealander troops on the beaches of Normandy, France. Once the beach was secure and more supplies and troops could be landed, the Allies began pushing west towards Germany. And I go into more detail on that in the Modern History playlist. July 1st through 22nd of the same year, uh, 1940, so a month later, uh, a, a meeting was held in the state of New Hampshire at a, a place called Bretton Woods, B-R-E-T-T-O-N. This is the Bretton Woods Conference in which uh, the, the allies who were going to win the war, not yet, but they were on the way and they knew they were going to win, they began planning the post-war world, which we still live with. Uh, and it's at the Bretton Woods Conference that the United Nations Monetary and Financial uh, Conference convened to make financial arrangements for the post-war world. The conference was attended by experts uh, from 44 different governments or states, uh, including the Soviet Union. As, remember, we were allied with them during the Second World War. And uh, the Bretton Woods Conference uh, postulated a project, which later came into being, uh, creating the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development to make long-term capital available to nations needing such foreign aid initially in the, to rebuild after the war. But the project was later institutionalized in a way that's still with us, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, which continues to finance, well, among, among other things, uh, short-term imbalances and in international payments in order to stabilize exchange rates so that uh, nations who were members you know, would not default on their loan and then affect multiple economies. The Bretton Woods Conference recognized that exchange control, currency exchange control, and tariffs would probably be necessary after the war. And it, so it prescribed that such measures should be ended as soon as possible. And while they were, while they did endure, that they should be uh, arranged by, by mutually agreed upon negotiation. After uh, governments, uh, the Bretton Wood created the IBRD, and after the war in 1946, it became the IMF, um, and is still with us as the IMF. July 20th, 1944, a conspiracy of German officers succeeded in smuggling a bomb into a meeting in which Hitler was present. The plan was to assassinate him and take over the government and then surrender you know, to get Germany out of the war. But by, uh, you know, uh, 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 he survived. Hitler said he was wounded, but he survived the blast, so the war continued. On July 21st, 1944, uh, the American 3rd Marine, along with the Army 77th Division, landed on the island of Guam in the Western Pacific and succeeded in capturing it by August 10th. 10,000 Japanese soldiers fought to the death rather than surrender the island. July 25, 1944, the American 2nd Army Division, along with the, the 4th Marine Division, landed on the island of Tinian, captured it by August 2nd. And Tinian is the base from which the planes carrying the two atomic bombs would later launch to bomb Japan. Um, August 25, 1944, Paris was liberated by the Allies. From October 13th through October 16th, 1944, American and Japanese pilots engaged in a historic duel over the skies and off the coast of the island of Formosa, present-day Taiwan. It proved to be a decisive victory for the Americans. The Americans lost 75 planes. The Japanese lost 650 planes. On October 14th, 1944, while that was going on, 700 American vessels including transports moving 200,000 troops, approached the Philippine Islands to take them back from the Japanese. This culminated in the Battle, battle for Leyte Gulf, L-E-Y-T-E. Leyte Gulf is on the eastern side of the islands, south of Samar and north of Mindanao. By December 31st, 1944, the Americans had taken the island of Samar, but uh, the Japanese, they had to kill 70,000 Japanese troops to do it. The island of Mindanao would not be retaken until July 15, 1945. 
On December 16, 1944, the Germans launched a surprise counterattack against allies in the Ardennes Forest near the border of Belgium and Luxembourg. This is better known as the Battle of the Bulge uh, at Bastogne. Bastogne is the name of the place. Uh, Bulge just refers to the, you know, that they had managed to move back the Allied lines, but only in a salient. So, yeah. Uh, it took until January 16, 1945, for the Allies to overcome it and resume the drive to Germany. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1944, Pope Pius XII gave another public address, radio address, which repudiated the concept of collective guilt, which was gaining widespread acceptance as the appalling carnage of the war mounted. So collective guilt is the idea that each individual member of a society was morally accountable for the actions taken by that nation in time of war. In 1946, uh, Pope Pius created 32 new cardinals who would participate in electing his successor, whom we shall meet in due course. From March 9th to March 10th, 1945, the Americans uh, firestormed, firebombed uh, Tokyo with 334 B-29s dropping 1,667 tons of incendiary bombs. Um, and once again, as, the, as it had done at Hamburg, uh, once the temperature reached 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, it became a weather system, and the Coriolis effect caused the, you know, the, a, a vortex. So uh, a 1,500-foot-tall you know, tall tornado or fire that was hot enough to melt concrete. Fifteen square miles of the city was just completely incinerated. Eighty-three thousand were killed. Another hundred thousand were injured. President Roosevelt, FDR, died uh, during the war. He died in, uh, uh, on, in April of 1945. He uh, actually died in Georgia. He was uh, visiting in uh, Georgia. His vice president, his last vice president, was Harry Truman. So Harry Truman immediately followed as president number 33 from April 12, 1945 uh, until January 20th, 1953. Uh, in terms of religion, uh, Truman was, a, was Baptist, but uh, he generally kept his religious beliefs and practices private. But he... Uh, he was a, a member of the first Southern Baptist uh, of, the, of the. It was a Southern Baptist, and he was the first Southern Baptist elected president of the United States. Uh, and his, uh, to finish Roosevelt's term, he did not have a vice president. But when he he ran in his own right in 1948, and uh, then his vice president was Albin A L B E N W Barkley. Okay. Um, Truman served nearly eight years in office. He had an uh, enormous challenge. He had, to, he had to finish World War II. And, and then Truman's foreign policy and domestic policy set the terms for the Cold War, which followed, in which, you know, when the United States and the Soviet Union ceased to be allies, as they were in the Second World War, and became global adversaries. At, uh, domestically, it was fairly straightforward. Truman... Uh, protect, reinforce, you know, he pursued the New Deal policies uh, as much as possible, continued them going. And domestically, Truman oversaw uh, the transition of the American economy from wartime to peacetime footing. He also uh, advanced the cause of African American civil rights, you know, which was not expected from a, a guy from Missouri. All right, uh, so Truman was born on May 8, 1884, in the town of Lamar in Missouri. Uh, though he's associated with independence because that's his family moved there. He grew up in independence. Um, as a child, he was an avid reader. I mean, even outside of school, he just he liked to read. He liked read history, read literature. He learned as a child to play the piano, and that's remained a, a comfort for him uh, throughout his life. Uh, he he dreamed of becoming a soldier, even you know even before the any any of the the major wars. He he attempted to gain a uh, admission appointment to West Point, the, the U.S. United States Military Academy at West Point, which would have given him a, a, a commission in the Army. But he was rejected because of his poor eyesight. 
Uh, his, he instead worked on the family farm from 1906 to 1914. He learned to detest farming, but he did learn a great deal. You know, many important lessons he learned uh, in, in farming that stayed with him in terms of his work ethic, you know, getting up early, and organizing things. Uh, and it, it contributed to a, a very practical, even when he got into government, you know, which is kind of you know office work, but but he, he never lost that that practical that practicality that he learned from farming. Uh, uh, during this period, he met Virginia Wallace. His nickname was Bess. Uh, he proposed marriage to her in 1911, but she refused. Uh, and they eventually did marry in 1919 after the First World War, in which uh, which he served, as we'll see. Five years later. After the marriage, they had their first and only child, a daughter named Mary Margaret. In 1914, Truman's father died, and uh, he he attempted unsuccessfully to make a living as owner and operator of a small mining company and oil business, all while trying to keep the farm going. In 1917, uh, Truman uh, he was he couldn't go in the army, but he was accepted in the National Guard, the State National Guard of Missouri. And that unit shipped out to France as part of the American Expeditionary Force fighting in the First World War. And, uh, you know, he still had poor eyesight, but, you know, they, he, they ac- he accepted him. He, he was an officer uh, and turned out soldiering, you know, uh, suited him. Uh, he turned his, his battery, it was an artillery uh, battery, um, into a, a top-notch unit. And the men, you know, were loyal to him they, personally. They were, you know very well liked by his men, strict but fair. Returned home from the war, uh, he opened a, a, a men's a haberdashery, like a, a, a it's, it's generally thought of as a hat, but it's not just hats, it's just like a men's store, clothing store, shirts, ties, socks, uh, hats. Uh, he opened it with an army buddy, but the shop failed. Uh, in 1922, uh, Thomas J. Prendergast, who was a, uh, the Democratic boss of the party machine in Missouri, asked Truman to run for a judgeship on the county court of Jackson uh, Eastern District. Truman won because, you know, it was the machine, so that, that's what happened. He served one term, um, then became presiding judge in 1926, a position he held until 1934. As presiding judge, Truman managed the county's finances during the early years of the Great Depression, and I, I know that, that may not sound right because you know that that's not the way it's it's anyway. That's it, it was not unusual in that in that time. So the the position of judge did not have as uh, narrowly defined a role as it does today. Um, despite his association with the, the the political machine and therefore corruption. Truman, nevertheless, personally had a reputation for integrity, honesty, and efficiency. In 1934, Truman was elected to the U.S. Senate, uh, again as the, you know, the Prendergast political machine candidate. As a senator, Democrat, uh, Truman supported Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, he became a national figure when he chaired the, what was called the Truman Committee, uh, investigating government defense spending. Uh, FDR chose Truman as his running mate in 1944, uh, largely because uh, so uh, Truman's earlier vice president was uh, Henry Wallace, who was very liberal, much more liberal than Roosevelt, and um, and was mistrusted. You know, as Roosevelt aged when he you know ran for another term, people were seriously thinking, okay, whoever the vice president is may end up the president, and and many people who had supported Roosevelt thought that Wallace, they, they, didn't, they didn't trust him to be president. They thought Wallace was too liberal. So Roosevelt was looking for a more conservative person who was still a Democrat. So a Missouri, you know, Southern, a Southern Democrat um, passed, you know, was acceptable. So the Roosevelt-Truman ticket won a victory. Um, though Truman served only 82 days as vice president. With the death of FDR on April 12th, 1945, he became president. Okay, he took office as the Second World War was coming to an end. Uh, only two weeks after Truman became president, Adolf Hitler committed suicide in Berlin rather than face capture by the Soviet Union, by the Soviet Army. Uh, the Allies declared victory in Europe on May 7, 1945, but the war in the Pacific 
continued. And most believed that Japan would not surrender, that we, we, that we would have to actually invade the islands of Japan and fight them street to street. So the U.S. and British governments had uh, secretly begun to develop a new type of weapon using fission, atomic fission, so this the atomic bomb. It was successfully tested in the summer of 1945, uh, and it turns out uh, we had built three of them. The first of the three was tested at Almogordo in New Mexico. It was proof of concept, so we had two more. Truman, uh, though there was some debate, you know, internally among his cabinet, and not 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 all of the cabinet was, you know, convinced that that should be done. Uh, never, nevertheless, when the the chairman of the uh, the army chief of staff, you know, the, the uh, George Marshall, told him the estimate that it, that we would lose a million men trying to take the islands of Japan, uh, Truman decided, well, it was, it was worth using these bombs to end the war quicker, and in the long run would save more. American lives as well as Japanese lives. So on August 6th, the, the U.S. Army Air Corps dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Japan did not surrender, despite the fact that over 100,000 people were killed. So three days later, on August 6th, a second atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. And the, the, the militarists who were in charge of Japan, they were still not going to surrender because they knew for them it was, you know, they would have to commit suicide or if they were captured, they'd be put on trial for war crimes and then executed. So they were still not going to surrender. It was the Emperor Hirohito, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito, who behind their backs gave a radio address and in which he's, you know, let the Japanese people know. Because the unconditional surrender was the thing that, you know, that they said, if you're fighting because you, th you think the unconditional surrender is going to mean losing me, you know, that the, that, the, that the victors will eliminate the monarchy, then don't. You know, don't, don't fight to save me. You know, surrender in, in order to, to save Japan. Because, you know, of course, he didn't know that we didn't have any more of those bombs ready to drop. He thought, okay, they're just going to burn our cities one by one. So, you know, that... Don't do this for me. And that's why he was he was allowed to remain emperor after the war. Anyway, then Japan surrendered. Uh, Truman then, um, uh, you know, faced, you know, a, a, a surprise, at least in the moment. It was a surprise. Maybe in retrospect, it's not so much of a surprise. But uh, that the that the alliance with the Soviet Union, the wartime alliance, very quickly uh, fell apart after the war because of you know the, the serious ideological differences between the, the the western style capitalism of the United States and Great Britain France as opposed to the collectivist communist ideology of the Soviet Union and uh, what what set Truman off was that, uh, the Soviets, you know, as they attacked after Stalingrad, they moved west. So they, they made it in just by, by right of conquest. I mean, they, they made it into Eastern Europe and Eastern Germany on their own. And and they weren't going to leave. You know, Stalin's, okay, th this is ours by right of conquest. And he wanted a buffer, you know, uh, between Russia and Germany. He wasn't going to leave. And, and by that point, you know, he had literally millions of, of troops there. And the only way to get them out would be for us to go to war with them. So by 1949, the Soviet Union and America and its allies, Great Britain, Russia, uh, France, divided Europe into a Soviet-controlled bloc in the east and the American-supported grouping in the west. In the same year, 1949, a communist, ideological communist um, insurgency managed to, to seize control of China under the leadership of Mao Zedong. China was then and still remains the, the most populous nation. The Cold War, as it was called, between the United States on one side, the Soviet Union, and other communist countries on the other, uh, lasted against the Soviet Union you know, for, for, for decades, really, until the Soviet Union fell in 1991. And uh, anyway, that's... that's uh, 
uh, transitioning from a post-war, uh, transitioning from a wartime economy to a post-war economy. As it happened, estimates are that because of the damage during the war and because of the way industrialization had proceeded, that 75% of the industrial capacity on the planet Earth was in the United States. So that explains the, you know, the, the, the economic boom of the late 40s and the 50s in the United States because there were no competitors and everybody in the world who wanted to rebuild had to buy stuff from us. Uh, okay. Uh, so he ran for a second term. Uh, 1948, he won. All right, then there's the Korean War. Uh, well, that that afflicted his uh, second term, but all right. So uh, Hitler committed suicide on April 30th, 1945. Uh, Germany surrendered on May 7th, 1945. Uh, July 16th, 1945 was the test detonation of the first atomic bomb at Almogordo, New Mexico. Uh, as I said, August 6th, the uh, first one on uh, Hiroshima, second on Nagasaki on August 9th, and Japan surrendered the following day, August 10th. The actual document, the instrument of surrender, as MacArthur called it, was signed on September 2nd, 1945, aboard the USS Missouri battleship, which was docked in Tokyo Bay. So if you Google it, that, that's you'll, you'll find that image. It's a famous, famous image. The year after the war, uh, with regard to religious history in the United States, 1946, a Supreme Court case was heard. Um, it went on from November 20th, 1946 to February 10th, 1947. This was the Everson versus the Board of Education of the Township of Ewing, New Jersey. Ewing is E-W-I-N-G. Uh, the, uh, so it was argued before the court on November 20th, 1946, and the decision was rendered on February 10th, 1947. Okay, at issue. A New Jersey law authorized reimbursement from local school boards of the cost of transportation to and from schools, including private schools. 96% of the private schools which benefited from this law happened to be parochial Catholic schools, meaning schools attached to a, a Catholic church parish. A guy named uh, uh, Arch, 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 Archibald, Archie, uh, Archie R. Everson, was a, 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 a citizen, was a taxpayer, lived in Ewing Township, uh, New Jersey. He filed a lawsuit alleging that this was indirect aid to religion and therefore violated both the New Jersey state constitution as well as the First Amendment. He lost in state courts. And it appealed. Uh, it got appealed. He had support of this. For, and, and it got appealed to the Supreme Court on purely federal constitutional grounds. The question being, did the New Jersey statute violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment? In a 5-4 to four decision, with the majority opinion being written by Hugo Black, whom we've already met, uh, the decision was that the New Jersey law reimbursing parents did not violate the Establishment Clause as it did not pay money directly to parochial schools and it was not limited. It was not only parochial schools, only religious schools, but any private school was eligible. It just so happened that a numerical majority of them, you know, but, but if that changed, it would, it would still be, you know, private schools, non-religious schools would, so it was, it was not uh, establishing a church. Okay. 1947, March 12th, a major step to create the architecture of the Cold War. This is the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine arose from a speech delivered by President Truman before a joint session of Congress on March 12th, 1947. The precipitating trigger for the speech was an announcement by the UK the British government, that as of March 31st, it would, that meaning the end of that month, it would no longer provide military or economic assistance to the Greek government, which was in the midst of a civil war against a Greek communist insurgency. 
So Truman was requesting from Congress funds for the United States to take the UK's place, for the United States to take over supporting the Greek government against the communist insurgency. He also requested that Congress provide assistance for Turkey, since that nation, too, had previously been dependent on British aid. At the time, the U.S. government believed, certainly Truman believed, that it was the Soviet Union directly supporting the Greek communist insurgency. And they worried that if the communists in Greece prevailed in the Greek Civil War and took over Greece, that the Soviets would, would de facto control Greek policy. And in fact, this, the, the, there was something to that. The Soviet leader, Stalin, uh, had deliberately refrained from providing any overt support to Greek communist. Um, but nevertheless, that okay. So that was what it was. Uh, so this, the Truman Doctrine, is because it was replicated. You know, even though it was announced in this particular circumstance, it kind of set. Not, not kind of, it did. It set precedent that during the Cold War, the United States would support anti-communist governments, you know, based on the assumption that any appearance of communism was orchestrated by the Soviet Union. Okay. Uh, accordingly, uh, Truman requested that Congress provide $400 million of aid to both Greek and Turkish governments and the support of American civilian and military personnel and equipment to the region, meaning the Aegean, the Aegean Sea. Uh, Truman justified this on two grounds. I'm sure you can find the speech on YouTube if you want to read it. But just to summarize, uh, he argued that a communist victory in Greece would endanger the political st stability of Turkey and would lead to undermining political stability in the rest of the Middle East and would lead to a domino effect. You know, that if Greece fell, then Turkey would fall. And if Turkey fell, then Syria would fall. And if Syria fell, Iraq would fall. You know, so that, that and then the communists would take over the world. He also argued on a different level, a more philosophical principled level, he argued that the United States was compelled morally to assist free peoples anywhere on earth in their struggles against totalitarian regimes, not just communist regimes, but any, any collectivist authoritarian regime, because such regimes, quote, undermine the foundations of international peace and hence the security of the United States. In the words of the Truman Doctrine, it became, quote, the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures, end quote. And uh, that's, in retrospect, that's it. That's a declaration of the Cold War. June 5th, 1947. Uh, the immediate post-World War II Europe was, was wrecked. I mean, even the countries that won, you know, they, they were just, they were wrecked. And uh, their economies were, were, were ruined, which, which means they were susceptible to the same problem that was happening in Greece, to internal communist insurgency. So, in a June 5th, 1947 speech to the graduating class of Harvard University, the Secretary of State, George C. Marshall, who had previously been, when he was on active duty in the Army, General Marshall, so that the head of the, you know, the, the chief of staff, uh, issued a call, named for him, the Marshall Plan, of uh, funding a comprehensive program to rebuild Europe. I mean, the United States would fund a, a program to rebuild Europe. And this was anti-communist, you know, fearing that, that if the economies were wrecked, that communists would be able to exploit that and, and then take over the governments. Uh, and Congress bought it. Uh, so Congress passed the Economic Cooperation Act, in March of 1948, approving the funding of $12 billion, which would later increase, for the rebuilding of Western Europe. So the Economic Cooperation Act was the enabling legislation of the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan generated an, a resurgence of Western European, meaning our allies, industrialization, and brought extensive investment into the region, building up their economy so they had to, they had to, you know, 
like we were funding it, but they were getting stuff from us to rebuild their economy. And then once their economy built was rebuilt, then they would have the money to buy stuff from us. That was the plan. Although, of course, as we've seen, then, then they united and become competitors. The EU is an economic competitor, although still a trading partner. So I don't want to, you know, exaggerate things. But <coughs> um, so the Marshall Plan was applied to Western Europe to our allies, you know, precluding the Soviet bloc, uh, which developed its own internal. You know, and solidified the Cold War differences. That would be just two, sep- two separate economic worlds that other countries could participate in, either part of the Soviet or part of the, the Western. Same year, 1947, July 26th, Congress passed the National Security Act of 1947, which did a major reorganization in light of the post war, but, you know, post war emerging hostility against the former ally, the Soviet Union. It turned out to be a major reset that is still with us of the foreign policy and military establishment of the U.S. government. The National Security Act created many of the institutions that we take for granted that presidents found useful when formulating and implementing foreign policy, including the NSC, the National Security Council. The council itself includes the president, the Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and other members, uh, which also created by this. So this also created the Central Intelligence Agency, the same act, and so the, the director of the CIA is also on the National Security Council. And it had a staff. The NSC had its own staff, uh, which would coordinate foreign policy material from other agencies in briefing the president. Beginning in 1953, the president's uh, assistant for national security affairs uh, directed this staff. Uh, each president has accorded the NSC, the National Security Council, and therefore the National Security Advisor, different levels of importance based on their personal relationship. Uh, Eisenhower, for example, used the NSC meetings to make key foreign policy decisions. So it mattered more, in other words, over Eisenhower whereas Presidents John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson worked more informally. It still existed. The NSC still existed, but they they preferred to work through trusted associates, some of whom were not on the NSC. Uh, Nixon. Uh, the, The NSC originally under Nixon was headed by Kissinger, then later he became Secretary of State. And uh, because of their personal relationship, the NSC was transformed from a mere coordinating body into an organization that actively engaged in negotiating with foreign leaders. So in some sense, it's usurping the role of the State Department. The National Security Act also created the CIA, uh, which grew out of the World War II OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. And uh, the CIA served as the primary civilian intelligence gathering agency in foreign lands. So that the CIA was prohibited, at least officially, from operating domestically. I mean, they had obviously they had their you know headquarters was here, but they they couldn't at least they were not, not officially supposed to spy uh, in the United States. That was for the FBI. Uh, later, the uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency became the main military intelligence body, whereas the CIA was civilian. The same National Security Act of 1947 uh, had did major reorganizations of the military establishment. What had been the War Department and the Navy Department, previously two separate departments, were merged into a single Department of Defense under a single Secretary of Defense, which is a cabinet-level position, meaning the appointment had to be approved by the Senate. Um, And in 1949, the act was amended uh, to recognize the creation, uh, another department of the... uh, the, the Joint Chiefs to recognize the Army Air Corps had become a separate branch, the, the Air Force. Okay, uh, next chronologically under Truman, the Korean War, which lasted from 1950 to 53. This conflict arose out of another post, post-war, you know, issue, the post-World War II uh, division of Korea between communist and not communist. So it was divided at the 38th degree of latitude, 
and to North Korea and South Korea, North being communist, allied with communist China, which had just taken over in 1949, and the South being allied with the West. Um, Now, why that line? Well, Soviet forces, communist forces, had accepted the surrender of Japanese forces who had occupied Korea at north of that line. And U.S. forces, uh, you know, uh, U.S. the U.S. forced the Japanese surrender south of it. So that it just happened to be, you know, where the Soviets and the Americans that that, that was it. So the plan initially well, was reunited, but the negotiations because because the the Soviet American alliance during the war broke down immediately after the war. Negotiations to reunite the Korean Peninsula dissolved because of the the ideological differences. So the North became a communist state and remains a communist state. Uh, in 1950, that communist portion, the North North Korea, invaded the non-communist part. They invaded South Korea. Truman was still president, and Truman ordered U.S. troops to assist South Korea. The U.N., the United Nations, which is the reformulated um, League of Nations, Security Council, minus the absent Soviet delegate, passed a resolution calling for assistance by all U.N. members in halting the advance of North Koreans. Not conquering North Korea, but just halting the advance. At first, North Korean troops drove South Korean and U.S. forces down the peninsula to the southern tip of Korea. So they were winning. The communists were winning. And then the the tables were turned by General Douglas MacArthur, re-enters our story. Uh, He planned and carried out an amphibious landing at Incheon behind the communist lines. And that turned the tide in favor of the U.N. troops, the majority of whom were American, and advanced uh, to the border. So MacArthur went farther than the 38th parallel. He actually pushed the communists back to the border between North Korea and China, which was the Yalu River. The Chinese, China, had now been taken over by the communists in the previous year, 1949. So they saw these Western forces approaching the border, and Mao, who was the the, the, the head of China uh, at the time, the communist head of China, uh, assumed or feared or assumed that the the West would just continue, that they would cross the Yalu River and invade China. So to prevent that from happening and keep the fight out of China, Mao had the Chinese enter enter the war. So he sent 300,000 Chinese troops across the Yalu River to attack UN forces in North Korea and and drove drove us back. I mean, you know, we lost that. You know that that uh, we didn't lose all of Korea, but uh, forced the UN and American troops back south of the. And so the the thirty eighth parallel was re re stabilized as the division between North and South Korea. Now MacArthur was not disposed to accept this. He um, he wanted Truman to drop five atomic bombs in southwest China to create a, a zone of death between the Yalu River, Korea, and further interior of China. And Truman refused, he refused to do that. And MacArthur was heard by associates to say uh, to, that Truman was a coward. Uh, so Truman fired him. He fired MacArthur. So the Korean War, uh, in the three years it went on, Uh, resulted in the death of 2 million Koreans, 600,000 Chinese, uh, 52,000 Americans, and 3,000 of other UN forces, uh, primarily British, but also some Turks, uh, some Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders. Uh, Okay. President 34, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, known by his nickname, Ike. He was sworn in as President Number 34 on January 20th, 1953, remained in office until January 20th, 1961. He was born on October 14th, 1890. In uh, terms of religion, he was um, 
Presbyterian, but he had, it was more complicated than that. His religious background is you know, kind of drifted. So his parents converted to what was then called in their life the Bible student movement. That was the forerunner of the Jehovah Witnesses. Originally, the family, before this, but the family had belonged to a Mennonite sect. According to Eisenhower's presidential library, there's no evidence that Eisenhower himself participated in either the Bible student group or uh, when it was renamed the Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, But there are records that show he attended Sunday school with the Mennonites. Until he became president, Eisenhower had no formal church affiliation since he spent his career in the Army and moved around you know, so much. Uh, he was baptized and confirmed and became a participant, a regular participant in the Presbyterian Church, beginning on uh, the ceremony occurred on February 1st, 1953, just 12 days after his inauguration into his first term as president. Eisenhower was instrumental in adding the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954. And in 1956, when Eisenhower was president, uh, he approved uh, the adoption of the term in God we trust as the motto of the United States. And it's 1957 introduction and printing on our currency. Uh, Eisenhower is reported to have routinely began cabinet meetings with a period of silent prayer. And he met frequently with a wide range of religious leaders while he was in office. His presidential library includes an interdenominational chapel, which is still there. You can visit it. And uh, he, his wife, Mamie, and his first son, firstborn son who died in childhood, are all buried there. Okay, Eisenhower was born in Texas, but raised in Kansas. He, um, a friend of his, earned an appointment to the uh, U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, so that inspired Eisenhower. And he earned an appointment to a different academy, West Point, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, which is a feeder into the Army. Uh, Although as a Mennonite, especially his mother, had pacifist leanings, but she didn't try to stop him from becoming a military officer. Uh, After graduating from West Point, Eisenhower experienced uh, years of professional stalling, uh, you know, because World War I ended a week before he was scheduled to go to Europe. And then after the First World War, the United States demobilized, you know, so that there there weren't that many positions left for him. But he had an officer's commission because he graduated, but his career was stalled. Uh, He married Mamie Dowd in 1916. They had a son named John in 1922. And throughout the 20s, he he got assignments uh, that were staff assignments. And that allowed him to gain experience as well as demonstrate his abilities in those regards. He served as a military aide to President John Pershing and then to Douglas MacArthur. Uh, shortly before the United States entered the uh, Second World War. Eisenhower earned his first star with promotion to Brigadier General. After the United States entered the Second World War, Eisenhower went to Washington, D.C. to work as a staff officer, planning officer, for the Army Chief of Staff, General George C. Marshall, whom we've already met. And then uh, from that he got, he got command assignments. In 1944, he became Supreme Commander of Operation Overlord, which was the Allied, the planned Allied invasion of Normandy, you know, to, to assault Nazi-occupied Western Europe. In only five years, Eisenhower rose from a lieutenant colonel in the Philippines to commander of the greatest invasion force numerically in American history. When he returned home in 1945, he served as Chief of Staff of the Army following his former boss, General Marshall, uh, Truman asked Eisenhower to run as his vice president in 1948, but Eisenhower refused. Instead, he became president of Columbia University. But then the Korean War broke out, and Eisenhower went back to uh, active duty. He became the first supreme commander of NATO forces in Europe. In 1952, uh, he announced that he was a Republican. <laughs> 
and he returned home, and he won his party's nomination with Richard Nixon as his running mate. And he beat uh, the Democrat for president, Adelaide Stevenson, in the 1952 election and again in 1956. So he served two terms in office. Uh, all right. The uh, race issue uh, was, you know, the uh, the very first, you know, uh, uh, lecture in this playlist. We talk about, you know, slavery and, and how that issue is, and even after slavery was was uh, outlawed, uh, the the racial, you know, issue, the racial animosity remains. In 1957, Eisenhower sent federal troops to Little Rock, Arkansas, when mobs tried to block the integration of a high school. Um, let's see. Six months after he became president, Eisenhower agreed to an armistice, a ceasefire that ended the Korean War. On only, uh, only on one other occasion in Lebanon in 1958, uh, did Eisenhower send troops into combat uh, briefly. Uh, he frequently authorized the CIA to undertake covert actions, secret interventions to overthrow governments that were uh, communist to, in order to install anti-communist military governments. So the CIA did this with his authorization in Iran in 1953, in Guatemala in 1954, tried to do it in Indonesia in 1958, but it backfired. Um, and he did authorize troops uh, and uh, airstrike uh, in, in, in Indochina. So Indochina refers to a peninsula that now are the countries of uh, 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 Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And so this was the beginning of what ended up being uh, the American involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh, okay. All right. 1954. Um, Brown versus the Board of Education. All right, we'll pause there because that's going to lead to. So, uh, anyway, we'll, I went on longer than I should have. So, we'll pause there and pick up with the uh, post war period next time. Thank you for your attention. The session is adjourned.